The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. I thought something ain't right. Doctor said he had stage four cancer. My whole life come to a screeching halt. And less than a year to live. I believe I'm at the bottom. I can't go no lower. Hear the story of a true survivor. Medical science gave up on me. They sent me home to die. On today's 700 Club. There's no more cancer in his body. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. 75 years ago today, Allied forces landed in France. The D-Day invasion drove out the Nazis and eventually ended the war in Europe. Today, President Trump and France's President Macron honored the men who took the Normandy beaches, and some of those men, well into their 90s, were on hand. CBN's Jenna Browder reports. Remembering D-Day 75 years later, a 21-gun salute, flyover, and joint French and American playing of taps to mark the beginning of victory over Nazi Germany and honor the Allied troops who carried out the strike. Sixty surviving veterans were in attendance, President Trump thanking them in his own words. You are among the very greatest Americans who will ever live. You are the pride of our nation. You are the glory of our republic. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And French President Emmanuel Macron bestowing five Americans with France's highest honor. 97-year-old paratrooper Tom Rice landed on the beaches of Normandy in 1944. And this week reenacted the jump alongside a plane load of current members of his 101st Airborne Unit. Yes. Great, great. Beautiful drive, beautiful jump, beautiful flight. Everything was perfect. The landing, he says, not perfect, but Tom proving he is still tough as nails. The DJ jump. I landed standing up for the most part and then went down to my knees and bounced a couple times because I had so much equipment and I had a difficult time getting out of that equipment. It's that same toughness thousands displayed on D-Day. I don't want anybody to forget this. It's too important. It's, it's just too important to our country. As the greatest generation passes on, about 300 World War II vets die every day. Presidents Macron and Trump both vowed never to forget. May God bless our great veterans. May God bless our allies. May God bless the heroes of D-Day. And may God bless America. And before the ceremony, President Trump and the First Lady visited the French cemetery where more than 9,000 troops are buried. After this, he heads to Ireland to conclude his European trip. Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, it's been called, and it is, the greatest generation. And if you know a veteran of World War II, please thank them. This is a, a, a wonderful day of remembrance, those who fell on the beaches of Normandy, but through their sacrifice, an incredible victory was won and the modern world was shaped. But we need another great generation. We're facing so many challenges today. We need to rise up to those challenges and say, yes, uh, if that generation can do it, our generation can do it. In other news, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi told Democratic leaders that as far as President Trump is concerned, Impeachment isn't enough. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. She wants to go further. Speaker Pelosi saying she wants to see the president, quote, in prison. Politico reports Pelosi made those remarks in a Tuesday night meeting with senior Democrats as she disagreed with House Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler. He reportedly pushed Pelosi to let his committee start an impeachment inquiry, but Pelosi still opposes that idea. She said, quote, I don't want to see him impeached. I want to see him in prison. She wants Trump defeated in next year's election, then prosecuted for his alleged crimes. Well, top American and Mexican officials continue in del delicate talks today, hoping to stop U.S. tariffs from going into effect Monday. Vice President Mike Pence met with Mexican officials Wednesday for an hour and a half. 
The administration wants Mexico to work harder to stop the flow of Central American migrants heading to the United States border. The president threatening a 5% tariff on all Mexican imports starting next week, with steady increases if the situation does not improve. The president tweeting ahead of today's negotiations, progress is being made, but not nearly enough. Border arrests are at 133,000 because of Mexico and the Democrats in Congress refusing to budge on immigration reform. Democrats and Republicans responded to the president's tough talk. This is not a way to treat a friend. It's not a way to deal with immigration. I think there's going to be an agreement and there won't be any tariffs. The number of illegal immigrants detained in May is a 30 percent increase over April and the highest in 13 years. While many Senate Republicans believe tariffs will hurt the U.S. economy, they also share the president's desire to stop the flow of illegal immigration. CBN News Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson spoke with some lawmakers who may not like the idea of tariffs, but believe the threat could create leverage to help resolve the crisis at the southern border. In a rare rebuke of the administration, Senate Republican leadership warns President Trump to abandon the proposed 5% increase on Mexican goods set to take effect Monday, or they'll vote to block them. We're not fans of tariffs. We're still hoping that this can be avoided. Trump has threatened to raise tariffs as high as 25% by October and doesn't appear worried by party pushback. No, I don't think they will do that. I think if they do, it's foolish. Uh, there's nothing more important than borders. Although he could be misreading the GOP concern over how tariffs might affect the economy. A veto might be overridden. That's my sense. Texas Congressman Michael Cloud agrees with Trump that Mexico should step up. And there's a number of things that Mexico do, could do to be participating with this problem. Cartels are have such an entrenched position in their country and they've allowed it to fester into a cancer um, and we'd be happy to partner with them in helping solve that problem. And argue some good just might come from the president's threat. The president threw out uh, the idea of imposing tariffs and it got Mexico on the plane the next day. So um, I, I think it's a negotiating strategy, we'll see, uh, but the goal is, is to get Mexico to act. Senator Mike Braun agrees. And I think it's refreshing to see that there's a new dynamic to where we just won't keep kicking everything down the road. But hopes the tariffs never take effect. I would hate to see it put in peril, the replacement for NAFTA. Arguing Mexico is one of our biggest trading partners. Uh, I think it also could have the effect of maybe impacting the economy. And that's the strongest thing that we've got to talk about to get President Trump reelected. Despite strong Senate GOP opposition to tariffs they believe tax American consumers, the party's still united in supporting the president on border security. President Trump is 100 percent right in terms of what we need to do at the border. Senator Marco Rubio is breaking with party leadership, acknowledging in a tweet he doesn't like tariffs, but what alternative do my GOP colleagues have to get Mexico to secure its southern border? Trump signaled this week he's not bluffing and believes it's more likely the tariffs take effect Monday than reaching a solution through negotiations, creating a strong possibility of the first veto override of his presidency. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abigail. The Trump administration is ending fetal tissue research at the National Institutes of Health, but government-funded research at some private universities will continue for now. The Department of Health and Human Services said it's seeking to consider both pro-life and pro-science perspectives in its decision. Scientists say fetal tissue research has helped fight diseases like rubella and HIV, while pro-life advocates say using fetal tissue from elective abortions is immoral and unethical. Well, the memorial site of the 12 victims killed in Virginia Beach last Friday has become a gathering spot for those who want to grieve and pay their respects. Chaplains with the Billy Graham Rapid Response Team have been there all week to offer prayer to those who need it. Chaplain Coordinator Bob Poff told CBN News about a special moment he had after a local pastor encouraged everyone to pick one victim's family to pray for. Contractor, because my father was a contractor. And Sunday afternoon, I met his granddaughter. Yesterday, I was able to meet his family, um, parents and, and wife and son. And 
And uh, that was very moving for me to be able to think that's who I'm praying for. And then I was able to uh, uh, pray with them in person. Tonight's Virginia Beach Remember Service honoring the victims and their families will be held at Virginia Beach's Rock Church. You can watch it live on the CBN News Channel beginning at 730. And Gordon, planners are expecting a packed house tonight. Yes, they are, and, and we need to remember these victims. We also need to help them. Uh, the financial needs are huge. Uh, the funerals have all now been paid for, but we're still looking for funding to help these victims, their families, those affected by this horrible shooting. If you want to participate in that, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. We set up a special Operation Blessing Fund for victims of Virginia Beach shooting. You can write us and send us a check, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, or you can go to the website, cbn.com slash vbshootingvictims, and show your support for these victims tangibly by giving a gift. Do it now, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, coming up, millennials speak out in support of socialism. It could really benefit our country in the future. I think it's a good idea. Socialism as a concept, as a philosophy is good. I think that it's got a bad rep. Wait until you hear what they said when asked to explain what socialism is. That's coming up. A growing faction in the Democratic Party, including some presidential candidates, is advocating socialist policies. And a recent Gallup survey shows 43% of Americans think socialism would be good for America. But many people don't understand what socialism really means or the consequences that it's brought to countries that have tried it. Jennifer Wishon explains. Not too long ago, advocating for socialist policies meant certain political suicide. But today, socialism is spreading through the halls of Congress as Democrats running for president race to embrace it. For 170 years, socialism in its various forms has been tried around the world, often followed by oppression, poverty and failure. Experts are closely monitoring this new embrace of socialism. They do want to turn America, as, as crazy as it may, may sound, into a socialist country. Democrats call it a bold, progressive step. I am going to go forward with a Medicare for all single payer program. So for people out there who like their insurance, well, they don't get to keep it? Let's eliminate all of that. We need to be bold. <laughs> the reasons why I signed on to the resolution, a co-sponsor of the resolution with the Green New Deal. Republicans argue it's completely out of touch. America was founded on liberty and independence and not government coercion, domination and control. We are born free and we will stay free. And while promises of free stuff like college tuition sound great, for many voters, the devil is in the details. And socialist policy proposals are top issues for the six million members of FreedomWorks. Americans don't support it when they understand who's paying for all this. Middle America isn't socialist. Middle America, you know, they value freedom and individual liberty. These are the things that Americans have always held dear. They're our founding principles. Webster defines socialism as a system or society in which there's no private property, where the means of production are owned and controlled by the state, a transition between capitalism and communism. Here in Washington, there's a memorial to the victims of communism, the goddess of democracy holds a flame over an inscription to the more than 100 million victims of communism and those who love liberty. Still, this political theory resonates with young people. In its annual survey, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation found 52% of American millennials prefer to live in a socialist or communist country. 40% prefer capitalism. Although a lot of them aren't sure what it is, the survey also found a quarter of Americans say they never learned about communism in school. Here's what happened when campus reform asked college students about socialism. It could really benefit our country in the future. I think it's a good idea. Socialism as a concept, as a philosophy is good. I think that it's got a bad rep. How would you view what socialism is though? Economically, what is socialism? 
economically. Hmm. So, hmm, I'm going to think about that for a second. Since property is owned collectively under socialism, Edward says supporters should get ready to hand over their smartphones and kiss religious freedom goodbye. The first thing they do is to close down the churches, close them up, and go beyond that, and as a matter of fact, to eliminate, if you will, eradicate, execute uh, pri uh, priests, pastors, sisters, nuns, people of faith. The absence of faith is why Joshua Moravchik thinks socialism has been so deadly. There is no moral law, there's no concept of sin, there's no concept of righteousness. The only righteousness is political. For Moravchik, loving and losing socialism has been a life journey. He grew up longing for it, serving five years as national chairman of the Young People's Socialist League, the same organization counting a young Bernie Sanders as a member. But today, Moravchik warns against it. He's the author of Heaven on Earth, The Rise and Fall of Socialism. And using history as his guide, Moravchik is disappointed to see socialism rising in popularity in the U.S. I understand why I once believed in it, and I understand why other people once believed in it, but why people would go back to that idea. To me, 200 years this idea has been tried in every way people could dream up, and it failed in every way. Ultimately, Moravchik doesn't think America will ever become a socialist nation, but Edwards believes we're seeing the culmination of what Democrats have been striving to achieve for decades. Whether you're talking about the New Deal, whether you're talking about the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson, whether you're talking about Barack Obama, Obamacare, and what he called bringing about a transformation of, uh, of America. So they've been working at it for 90 years. You know, candidates often tell us theirs is the most important election of our time. But in 2020, Americans may get to choose between capitalism and socialism. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Capitol Hill. Now, the best definition of socialism is the state owns the means of production. So start um, uh, imagining a United States where the state owns every automobile company, every telecommunications company. Uh, everything is owned by the state. The state owns the means of the uh, production. The problem with that is about basic economics, that if the state owns the means of production, then the primary means now to continue things is to protect the worker. And so instead of efficient allocation of capital into new industry and into worker efficiency, you have an allocation of capital to perpetuate jobs. Now, the common phrase in Russia 20 years ago was, we have full employment. When people would complain about efficiency or uh, the quality of goods, the response always came back, well, we have full employment. Uh, the problem with that is that you need to be able to fire people. You need to be able to allocate your capital into new growing businesses as opposed to dying businesses. And when you put all of that in the government, you are guaranteed to have inefficiency. That's the fundamental problem with it. And it always collapses when you run out of other people's money, when there are no more, longer any new businesses to acquire, more property to acquire, and all you've done is fuel the inefficient allocation of capital. That's the problem. So to hear it come back in America and to still be popular on the, our college campuses, they're just not teaching the history of what has happened to every single country that has tried these socialist experiments. Just look to Great Britain. Uh, back in the 1950s, when they were coming out of World War II, uh, all the rationing, uh, the tremendous poverty that the war uh, inflicted on that nation, uh, they turned to socialism, uh, and they tried that throughout the 50s, throughout the 60s, throughout the 70s. And then Margaret Thatcher came in and said, we got to get rid of all of this. We have to return the means of production to private enterprise to free up capital, to have efficient allocation, to create new jobs, create new productivity. Look to Britain if you think it works. Britain is a prime example. It doesn't. Derek? Well, up next, a man battling cancer for his life and losing. I was uh, discharged from the hospital at 112 pounds. I told my wife I can't go no lower. 
three weeks later, I went to 103 pounds. I couldn't walk. I couldn't eat. See how this man makes an amazing comeback. Plus, Gordon and I are going to be praying for you. So stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. At just 103 pounds, Joe Heflin was a rack of bones. After battling cancer for two years, he was sent home from the hospital to die. But Joe didn't die. Instead, he lived to become a miracle. In March 2012, 55-year-old Joe Heflin noticed abnormal swelling under his arm. He had a feeling it was a sign of something worse. After showering, I always look in the mirror looking for ticks because we have a lot of ticks in the woods here. And I always check my armpits and on, on one of them I, I noticed there was a large knot under my left arm. I looked at the other side and compared them and I thought something ain't right. He visited his doctor for a biopsy and was diagnosed with cancer, stage four, large B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Doctors predicted Joe had six to 12 months to live. Despite the serious report, Joe was able to remain at peace. I think faith had everything to do with it. It wasn't but a few months prior to that, I was praying and I asked God to show me his glory and to glorify himself through me any way he desired. So I immediately had a little flashback to my prayer and uh, I just felt like that God would see me through it. He told his wife Candy and she agreed to stand with him in faith and prayer. I thought, you know, what am I gonna do? And it just seemed like to me that God spoke and said, you're gonna trust me. And so from then on, I just had a peace. I just felt like in my mind, whatever it is, there is nothing too hard for God. In passing days, Joe became violently ill. And over several months, his condition gradually worsened. I wound up having high fever. I sweated the bed down two or three times a night. Uh, I went into chills. I had a lot of bad days. Daily, Joe and Candy were encouraged by the prayers of family and friends, even strangers from all over the world. Being a preacher's kid, we knew everybody. 45 years of that, you know, there's foreign countries we've been to and just people from all over the United States. And then from my church that I attend 16 years, of course, they would tell other people and they would tell other people. And before we knew it, our story was going everywhere. And we began to thank God for the healing. And we quit asking Him to heal us. But we thanked Him because in the Word, the Bible says that we were healed by His stripes. Over the next two years, Joe was in and out of the hospital. His small intestines ruptured three times. It's a lot of mixed emotion whenever you're a very active person and you go in every single day and, and you work every day and, and all of a sudden for your life to just be put on hold. That was the hardest thing to deal with was the fact that uh, all of a sudden that my whole life come to a screeching halt. I couldn't have made it without my wife and uh, my wife's faith and my wife's prayers. After the third operation on his intestines in 2013, doctors didn't think he would survive. They released him from the hospital and recommended that he undergo six to eight chemotherapy treatments. By this time, he had lost nearly 80 pounds and was hardly recognizable to others, even himself. December 3rd, or 13, I was uh, discharged from the hospital at 112 pounds. I told my wife at that point, I said, honey, I believe I'm at the bottom. I can't go no lower. Three weeks later, I went to 103 pounds. I couldn't walk. I couldn't eat. As Joe began chemotherapy, Candy says she heard from God. It was like a 40-minute drive to the hospital, and I drove it every single morning, and I drove back home every single evening. And uh, one night, I was very exhausted, and I remember crawling in the bed, and that, that was it. I was out, and uh, I remember waking up, and I heard the voice of God. And he spoke to me and said, I'm going to heal him before three chemos. And I thought, okay, all right. I mean, you're God, you can heal him instantly. You know, you can do anything, you're God. But for whatever reason, I'm going to accept this. After just two and a half chemotherapy sessions, Joe called for treatment to stop and they continued to pray for complete healing. Candy scheduled a PET scan. At a follow-up appointment in April, 2014, they hoped for a breakthrough. And the doctor turned around and looked at me and he said, oh, by the way, a PET scan came back. And he said, 
there's no more cancer in his body. And I pointed at him and I said, I knew it. I knew it, I knew it. Because I know what God told me and I know what he spoke to me, that he was healed. Over the next few months, Joe's appetite returned and he began to regain healthy weight. Joe's medical records show no signs of cancer. He says there is only one way to explain it. The power of God is the only thing that raised me up because medical science gave up on me. They sent me home to die. They couldn't do anything else for me. But it's the power of God that raised, resurrected me and gave me another chance. At their home in Clarksville, Tennessee, a chalkboard still displays a message Candy wrote to keep their hopes up when her husband's health was at its worst. I took a piece of chalk and wrote on the chalkboard, we will survive, God is faithful. It's been there since as a daily reminder, God is faithful. If we could just trust in Him, He is faithful. After his experience, Joe says it's moments like that, the small things in life, that he appreciates the most. He loves road trips with his wife, Candy, and quality time with their children and grandchildren. The couple enjoys speaking around the world, telling others about Joe's miraculous healing. There's a big difference between truth and facts. And I chose to stand upon truth, not the facts. You know, the facts are that I had cancer. The facts are they looked under a mic microscope and saw it and diagnosed it. But the truth is that Jesus is the truth. And the truth says that I can be set free. The truth says I can be healed. So I stood upon the truth and ignored the facts. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I love the story of faith that this couple just clung to in times that would have, for most of us, I think, made us just let go. But this couple stood and we wanna stand for you today. You know what God did for Joe, he can do for you. And we can stand in faith together. It's why God puts us in family so that when we have needs, you know, they talked about the people they knew all around the world and how suddenly their story was being told everywhere. Well, today you have friends here and we're all gonna pray together. Every one of us who are watching this program right now, we're gonna pray together for your needs. And I, before we do that, I wanna tell you about Mary Ellen. She lives in Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts. She was watching this program. Gordon was praying one day and she whispered, please say leftovery. To her utter amazement, Gordon said, someone, you've got extreme pain in your left ovary. God has healed that. He is able to take away the cyst. He's able to take away all the issues and he's able to completely heal and completely restore. Mary Ellen said, it blew my mind. She got chills and by faith claimed God's healing power. She has not had any pain since then. Hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Here's Stan from Edmonds, Washington. He, five years ago, diagnosed with a brain tumor and then the prognosis, three to six months to live. Then on October 11th, 2014, Stan heard Terry pray, God is healing a brain tumor. One month later, Stan's doctor confirmed there was no evidence of a tumor, that it had been a complete miracle. Stan was completely healed, and now here he is five years later giving glory to God. He remains symptoms-free. Tests still show no tumor. That is a miracle. God is in the miracle business. That's what he does. He ever lives to intercede for you. He is praying for you. Just imagine that, Jesus praying for you at the right hand of the Father. Now, what is he praying? He's praying that his stripes would heal, that what he did, his sacrifice would heal you. And he has this great promise. If two or more agree touching anything, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Why will it be done? Because of his sacrifice. When we stand before God Almighty, we stand as if we never sinned, that we never did anything wrong, that He will look with heart of compassion and love on us. That's what He does. Jesus took away the veil so that we could come before Him and get the answer to our prayer. So let's believe God. Even if you're down to 103 pounds, the doctors have given up, you've stopped the chemo, you've stopped everything. Well, that's precisely the time where God can reach down 
You can never be too dead for a resurrection. So today, let's believe and trust God that what he has said he will do. His promises are for you forevermore. Let's pray. Lord, we just lift the needs of the audience to you. And we come boldly to the throne of grace. We come boldly into your presence. And we proclaim that by your stripes we are healed. We proclaim that your blood is sufficient to cover all of our sins, to wipe away all our iniquity, to justify us, just as if we'd never done anything wrong. So we claim the victory of the cross. We claim the victory of the cross over sin, over death, over disease, over pain, over infirmity. And we ask now that you would stretch forth your hand to do miracles. And we come into agreement. We reach out with a hand and touch and lay hands on that area of the body that needs healing. We proclaim out loud over it. We proclaim, be healed now and be every bit whole. In Jesus' name, amen. There's someone you're laying hands on your left knee. Uh, you've got a fractured kneecap. You're looking at um, surgery, and God has just healed it. He's just restored. What the doctors say can never happen, that uh, cartilage can never repair. God is repairing for you right now. He's knitting it all together. He's taking away that pain, that swelling. In Jesus' name, be healed and be set free. Terry? There are numbers of you who um, deal with the problem of high blood pressure. It's not just that you have it. You're on medication for it, and nothing you do or take seems to bring it down. God's healing that condition for you right now. It's just you're going to settle into a norm that is medically normal, and you're going to have success with this. And someone else, you have recurring styes in your eye. It is such an unsightly problem. God's healing that condition for you. Balance in all of your body. There'll not be any more. There's someone you've got breast cancer, and it's already spread into your lymph system. You have a swollen lymph gland underneath your right arm, and God is able. He is able to heal. He's able to restore. He's able to take away all the cancer now, in Jesus' name. Uh, just reach out and touch with your left hand. Reach out and touch that lump and just receive miracle healing power throughout your body. He's able to shrink that cancer and, and drive it away right now. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole. Someone with stomach acid, God's just healing that condition. It's going to be resolved now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do, all that you are, the sacrifice that you made for us, how you want to restore us into proper relationship with you. We receive it all from your hand. In Jesus' name, thank you. amen and amen. If you've been touched, if you've been healed, let us know. Give us a call. We always rejoice in what God is doing today. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we absolutely believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that doesn't give up but looks for an answer. You just saw a story of two um, heroes of the faith holding on to the Word of God that they had all the way down to 103 pounds. They got their miracle. That's prevailing prayer. So we're here for you 24 hours a day. It's our honor, our privilege to pray for you. So if you need prayer, all you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, meet the legend played by actor Cuba Gooding Jr., the real radio and his coach. He loves to give hugs. I mean, if you're having a bad day, he can really raise you back up, you know? He's just part of our family. Discover the 50-year friendship that inspired the hit movie. That's coming up. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Pope Francis has officially approved a change to the Lord's Prayer. The change proposed by Vatican scholars last month replaces lead us not into temptation with do not let us fall into temptation. That's from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 13. 
U.S. Catholic reported the Pope believes the new version is better because the first translation implies that God leads people in temptation and action scholars say is against his nature as a good and holy God. Well, it has been 35 years since President Ronald Reagan made his famous speech celebrating the invasion of Normandy back in 1984. Take a look. For four long years, much of Europe had been under a terrible shadow. Free nations had fallen. Jews cried out in the camps. Millions cried out for liberation. Europe was enslaved and the world prayed for its rescue. Here in Normandy, the rescue began. Here, the Allies stood and fought against tyranny in a giant undertaking unparalleled in human history. Reagan speechwriter Peggy Noonan, now an author and Wall Street Journal columnist, penned those words. You can see President Reagan's entire speech and get all the latest news and information of the day's events from CBN News. Just go to our website, CBNNews.com. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. May Long couldn't escape the insults all around her. Other children called her a monster and ran away from her. They weren't the only ones. Her parents abandoned her, too, because May Long was born with a cleft lip and palate. May Long was 11 when the woman she always knew as her grandmother told her she was adopted. Grandma Lou raised May Lawn as her own after she was found abandoned on the street because of her cleft lip and palate. I always told her to be strong. I said, don't feel insecure because of your mouth. But kids ran from her like she was a monster. Once, a boy spat on her. While May Lawn hid her emotions when this happened, she could barely look at herself in the mirror. Deep down, I wanted to be beautiful. I hated myself, and I felt like a joke. She loved fairy tales and dreamed of having a mouth like the movie star she saw on TV. I hoped that I'd meet a fairy and she'd touch my mouth and make me all better. But when Mei Lan's adoptive dad died, she lost hope that she'd ever get surgery and be beautiful. So she started working in the fields. She'd never gone to school and could barely write her name. I had no friends, no future. I felt like a bird without wings. Then a neighbor told Maylon's grandma about CBN. We quickly paid for cleft lip and palate surgery. I'm experiencing a very different life now. I can finally go to school. I feel pretty. I can look at myself in the mirror and smell with confidence like a movie star. I'm so happy and free. It's all because of you, CBN. You give me a new life. And that all because of you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. You're part of changing that wonderful girl's life, her innermost desire. I want to be beautiful. I, I want to have a change here. Can someone come and help me? And you were that one who came and that said, yes, I'll, I'll be a part of the change. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. You become part of a great family, tens of thousands of people that say, yes, let's make a difference in the world. Let's help people around the world, right here in America and around the world, in China, India, Philippines, Indonesia, Africa, Latin America. We're making a difference, and you can be a part of it. Just call us and say, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? Well, it's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. When you call and join, I've got a special gift for you. It's a brand new teaching from my father called The Plan. It's a summary of some of his, his most important messages throughout his life, his career and ministry, uh, where you can know God's plan for you. So if you want that, give us a call. And when you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving where the bank is doing all the work and there's no checks to write, nothing to mail in. And we send as our gift to you Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you'd like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call or just go to CBN.com. When you give monthly on the Internet, you'll automatically sign up for Pledge Express. Either way, do it now. 1-800-700-7000. 
Well, still ahead, we've got your email questions, so stay tuned. James Robert Kennedy is in his 70s, and he's been a junior at T.L. Hanna High School since 1970. He's also a permanent member of the Yellow Jackets football team and the inspiration behind Cuba Gooding Jr.'s role in the movie Radio. Take a look. Meet Radio. He's a bit of a legend here in the small town of Anderson, South Carolina. At 72 years old, he's still in the 11th grade and he wouldn't have it any other way. Every year they take a group picture in the gym of all the seniors in our graduate year. He will not get in that group. He said he knows he would have to leave. Not only is Radio a student at T.L. Hanna High School, he's perhaps the most revered member of its football team, the Yellow Jackets, even though he's never played a second of football. I think it was just God's plan that put radio right down there on that practice field. It was 1964 in the heat of August when JV coaches Harold Jones and Dennis Patterson noticed a young man coming to the practices every day holding a transistor radio to his ear. He started mimicking us, coaches and the players. And so we was trying to get him to come closer to us. We wanted him to get involved. So we said, well, let's, let's get off him a, a Coke, maybe, and a hamburger. And maybe we can get him good. And that was the trick. They learned he was 18-year-old James Robert Kennedy, nicknamed Radio because of his obsession with radios. In today's terms, he was born with an intellectual disability and was unable to learn how to read or write and could barely speak. But the coaches and players saw past that and soon made him one of their own. He wanted to be like the coaches and all. I was a defensive coach, so I'd give the sign, you know, and he'd do the same thing. And then every once in a while, if I, you know, got mad at an official, you know, he'd get mad at an official. Radio would become a permanent member of the team, going to practices, giving pep talks, and leading them onto the field before games. Radio really loved those guys out there, you know, and, the, and the coaches. He do win sprints, and you know, they, they loved it. He just grew a part of them. He came from a rough neighborhood across town and lived with his mom, stepdad, and younger brother, who was also intellectually disabled. Radio loved going into town, perhaps to escape the ridicule and bullying from kids in his own neighborhood. His mother, you know, she'd worked two jobs. She worked in the hospital, and then she did housework. And her biggest concern was these two boys, you know, keep them out of the institution. Well, I told her, we'll take care of radio while he's at the school and everything, don't worry about it. So in 1970, the coaches arranged for the 24-year-old to enroll in Hannah High School as a junior. Radio was ecstatic. I think that saved his life, being able to be out here at Hannah. He was learning all the time. But the community at Hannah High School would soon realize that what they got from radio was more than what they were doing for him. He loves to give hugs. I mean, if you're having a bad day, he can really raise you back up, you know? He's just part of our family. Like you say, I think the good Lord caused all that. This wasn't the first time Coach Jones reached out to someone who needed friendship. I had something in my heart for people like that. He was a kid about my age who lived across the street from him. A lot of people would pick on him. So I kind of defended him, you know, and he was my friend. I just think it was the right thing to do. In 1996, Sports Illustrated writer Gary Smith penned an article about the friendship between Coach Jones and radio. From there, Hollywood director Michael Tolan brought their story to the silver screen in the movie, Radio. When I'm answering an email, I always put down you know, if it's a student, I say, well, please find a student that has special need in your school and become their friend. Individuals got a special need. You know, they're just like you and I. They should be treated with respect and everything like we want to be respected. When Coach Jones retired in 1999, 
His biggest concern was whether his successor, Terry Honeycutt, and others would take care of his dear friend. He didn't have to worry long. They stepped up to the plate, each one. They love him. They want to be part of him, you know? They just, I mean, radio's a radio. Man. He's a man. One nation. Today, that friendship continues. And at Hannah High School, you will still find that same 11th grader greeting everyone with a smile and a hug and cheering on his beloved Yellow Jackets. From radio, a young man who couldn't learn how to read, write, or even play a sport comes a lesson we all need to remember. People with special needs, you know, they, they give us more love than we can actually return. It's a wonderful story and an encouragement to all of us to see the people around us and to open our arms and our hearts to them. Well, it's time to answer some of your email questions that have come in. And Gordon, this first one comes from a viewer who says, some say that baptism is a request and not a demand. Is this true? Well, it depends on who you're looking at. If you're talking about believers, is baptism necessary for salvation? The answer is no. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But it is a commandment for believers, and it's from Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we are supposed to baptize new believers. It's one of the great sacraments of the church. It's like the sacrament of marriage, the sacrament of communion. So I encourage people, please get baptized and please baptize new believers. Mm -hmm. This is Gladys who says, if my spouse dies and I fall in love again, will I know my first spouse as my spouse or my new spouse as my spouse in heaven? This is bearing on my mind. Well, Gladys, I hope you're not wishing your current spouse would go away. But <laughs> anyway, the, the Sadducees asked Jesus the same question. You find it in Matthew 22. And they went through this long thing. They said, you know, they asked him, who's going to be the, the, the husband? So they have this series of seven uh, within that scripture, teacher. Uh, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, who's going to be the, the, the wife? And they, he has this long thing, go through seven brothers. And so at the final, at the end, all of them die. And so they ask this question, who is going to be this woman's husband in the resurrection? And Jesus says to them very forcefully, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. Now, get that through your heart. In heaven, we're not going to have marriage. These are the words of Jesus. Uh, don't be mistaken and know the scriptures here. This is the power of God that we are going to be like the angels. We're not going to marry or, or be married. So uh, you're, you're going to know people and you're definitely going to know your relatives in heaven. Um, but don't worry about who are you going to be married to in heaven because uh, till death do us part. And at that, at that death, uh, we part. We leave you these words from Psalms 107. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. For Terry, for me, for all of us here, God bless you, and we'll see you again tomorrow.